Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the moment, our world is less than ideal. Our current languages limit us from communicating with other people, and some languages tend to dominate others. And those dominant languages can often shift quickly, leaving us in gaps of information that are harmful to society. So that's why Georgiana and I are very proud to propose the restart in full political force, the Esperanto Project. What, do I, what is the Esperanto Project? The Esperanto is the ideal language created in order uh, to achieve the best in language. Clarity of expression, the ease of learning, the strive for cultural neutrality or at least cultural sensitivity and representation. So that language, that idealized language is what we're proposing that we uh, restart by full political support by nations around the world, by international organizations. We propose that they move to send funding, political support, so this is a language that can be learned worldwide to everyone. Okay, so why, is, why do we propose that we do this? Uh, yeah, question. Yes. So you're going to... Where are all these resources going to come from? The teachers, the infrastructure, the money for those teachers, the, I don't know, the studies, the dictionaries, everything else, where are all these coming from? Yeah, so what we believe here is this project is so important that governments around the world should <coughs> put those resources forward to it and that the benefits derived from this uh, will ultimately be able to support that. Uh, and even if it wasn't, or even, uh, no thank you, even if it wasn't, uh, even if it was a massive cost of money, we think it's the appropriate cost of expense of money. Okay, so why is this so important? Basically, the way the world works right now is we have a couple dominant languages, uh, unfortunately, in the world. Often those languages uh, are English or French. Someday it might be Chinese. And what this does is it creates a very dangerous power relations between people. It's a very harmful power relation. And that's my first point. What do I mean by this? I mean that often negotiations around the world and business contracts and political contracts, even in personal interactions between people, are often have to be conducted in someone's second language. Now when it's conducted in someone's second language, what's happening is one person unfortunately often is uh, at an advantage because they don't have to do the same amount of translation in their head, they're able to focus quite clearly. So I'm always impressed when I come to debates and I'm uh, debating against people who uh, English is their second language uh, because they've already they've done so much. But I still often hear that because they feel they have to translate, they're not quite at the same ease. So this is an example here closer to all of us. So who? Uh, 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 why is this also very? Uh, why are these power relations also existing? That uh, there's always what happens is uh, those who. Um, Basically, those who, who are often learning these languages, these second languages, whether it's in diplomacy or uh, uh, elsewhere in the world, they're often coming from more privileged places. So what that means, I'm not saying everyone who has ever learned English uh, is Point. rich, but I'm saying what often happens is the people that are fluent in this have the access to that. And what it means is there's very important segments of society around the world that are not able to be expressed, that are basically having to channel themselves through some other intermediary that may not represent them quite uh, equally. Uh, the second thing is, well, what would happen is we, if we move to Esperanto, in the beginning, Esperanto will basically be a second language for most people. So what we'll be doing is we'll be putting everyone at a first, uh, at the same level in the beginning. Uh, everyone will be co uh, communicating in this uh, area. Now, uh, uh, no, thank you. Now let me get on to, uh, the second thing I want to talk about is some other particular benefits that what this one universal language will have. So basically, a one universal language will increase communication, and we think the increase in communication is going to be good for society. Uh, why? Here's some subpoints. The first one will be about technological. Now, if we look back to the time of the Renaissance, Latin was the dominant language. It was the language that was known among scholars. Now, what that allowed for is for people in very diverse areas who had their own native languages to speak in one common sure, language, be able to understand one another's thoughts, and be able to build upon one another's thoughts. And that means that people, uh, say in Italy, could understand Copernicus when he was writing about moving the Earth from the center of the universe to, and putting the sun at the center of the universe, as we know today. That's the type of powerful ideas that can be transmitted when there's one shared language. And our model is better because Esperanto will be available to everyone, where Latin is only available to the academics. Yes, we already 
have such a language which is available to everyone and we're all speaking it right now. Okay, this in the Western world we do. I would like you to say that to the people in China. I'd like you to say that in the sub, the people in the poor areas of India or all over the world who can't say that. No, thank you. No, thank you. So, uh, the other thing is, let me show you a specific example, and this will, go, this will go back to what was just said, of cases where we could arguably have a delay in technology because we didn't have a shared language. And this is when uh, it wasn't, there was already great advances in algebra written in Arabic, and it wasn't until uh, there was one person who happened to know Arabic and Italian who was able to understand that and write that in uh, the abacus, and that led to great advancements in the Renaissance. So this is the type of knowledge that may be existing all over the world that's basically trapped right now, and we could free for technological advances around the world. No, thank you. Another thing is, this could help uh, tremendously improve the internet. Right now, internet is often written uh, in English. If you had Esperanto, you're going to allow developers around the world to be able to write code, improve code. So that's going to be another technological advance here. Another important advance, this is the other stuff point, is just understanding each other. And that can be split into uh, a couple ways. First is personal understanding. So it would be much better for all of us if we could understand in one common language what people have been saying uh, as the importance in uh, the protests, say, right now happening in Turkey or all over through the Arabic world. As it stands now, we're always, almost always, having to mediate, have to go through some other source. And there's always that question in your mind, what exactly did it mean? Did the translator get it right? Was the tone right? Was this an idiom? What does that expression mean? Had they been able to speak in this one common language, we could understand with greater force and uh, be able to more accurately judge these very important political situations. And that goes to my second point about understanding each other better, is the political understanding. And this we could think of how this would help integration around the world. Now another situation we're facing in the world is the world is becoming uh, effectively smaller. We have more and more people, we're connected more and more by the internet, travel is much, much easier. So what happens is uh, we need to be able to solve problems between nations easier. And with the European Union, we already have to translate things in so many different ways. With one common language, we'd be able to speak on equal terms in a way we all understand it, leading to better political solutions for the major problems of the world today. For these reasons, let's restart the Esperanto project. So dear panel, the line of the opposition today is that languages don't come and go based on political view. They come with culture, they come with tradition, they come with understanding of a community with each other. You cannot just decide to introduce or reintroduce the language because you need to have a backup for that. But before, before, before developing on that, let me react to the opening governments case. So basically they were talking about this whole idea that there are some languages that, which dominate, which dominate others and this is bad for our, for our understanding with each other. But we think, we think this is not the case because the only language you can refer to here is the, is the English language. But the, the, the whole point of speaking English is that it's already become attached to the, to the global culture. It's not anymore just the Anglo-Saxon culture. We speak English because we belong to a global community and this is the language which we share together and this is a language which fits our needs. It's not, it's not dominant. And you can see this through the examples because if, if you make the argument that language is dominant, you have to refer how, how some countries which speak English uh, uh, exploit other countries which don't. And you can only refer here to the United States, but the United States was the country which voluntarily took up the English language. They take it from the Brits, and this means that they were identifying with this language because it, they were part of this global community, they were part of this global culture, and the same goes to India. They, were, they had many, many Indian tribes which didn't understand each other because they weren't speaking the language. And what language they pick? They pick English because this was the language which, they, which, which fits their needs the best. And then they were talking about that, how this re reinforces social inequality because you can only have talented and people with talented people and people with resources who are able to learn the language. But we think this is this is this is much more problematic if you introduce a language from, from the scratch. If you introduce Esperanto from the scratch, you have to produce all the dictionaries, all the technology which people need to learn this. And by this you're only reinforcing the existing social inequalities because you but right now you have you have a technology, you have an infrastructure which is able to teach people, this, the, the English language, and if you introduce something from the scratch, you have to invest a lot into this, and part of the burden will be on the people who want to learn the language. So this is something which actually much more reinforces the social inequality, the, the problem which they are concerned with. Um, and then they were talking about how this improves uh, communication, and, and, and they mentioned here the internet, how, the, how everyone will be able to write codes. I don't know if you ever written a computer code, but only the logical, like these linking words are in English. I mean, it's not, it's not like writing a text in English. If you know, if you know how, if you ever wrote, wrote an if clause, the only English words there are the if and the then. And this is something which comes with logic. It's not about what language 
is you write it in. It's, it's, about, it's about how you link things together in your head. And we think there is no point here, uh, that is, that, that's not justified introducing a new language from the scratch, a bit as Plantor, a bit, and, and, and any other one. And then they were talking about how this enhances uh, political understanding, and they brought up the example of the European Union. But the European Union, the way it functions, is that it has all the member states' languages as official language. But what happens is in, when, when, when politicians deliberate is that they pick one and they either pick English or they pick French because it's just much more convenient and because they all understand each other in these languages. So actually, even if you have the option, even if many languages are introduced, you will, only, you will always start to talk with each other in English because that's the most comfortable one and that's the most convenient one. And that's the reason why we think on the opposition side that we should stick with the status quo. Thank you. You've uh, rightly pointed out the horrible colonization history and oppressive history of the English language. Isn't it better to start with something fresh that doesn't have these bad associations? No, because, because starting from something fresh is not an option. Because how languages work? Languages come with culture. It, this, is, this is something which people were doing since, 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 since the beginning of civilization, naming their environment, naming the, 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 the things which they are meeting with in, the, in their immediate circumstances, shaping their thoughts into concepts. Thinking, thinking along the lines what the language allows them to do. And this is something which has, been a which has been a philosophical question right from Plato, right? I mean, he's the first who writes about this in Plato. It's not, it's not something which you can just start from the sketch because, because you need to have these communities which were sharing the same environment, which were coming from the same background, which went together through the same historical path, and they understand each other speaking the same language. And we think that this is the this is the reason why you have to have different first languages. So you have all these communities which they understand each other. But if you have a complementary language on which everyone is able to speak and which can add to your identity as a, to your national identity, a global global level, a global street, like this is what English allows you to do. It's it's something good because and this is the main point here that it, and what, what, the, what, the, what, the, what the government is trying to convince you is that English is English equals Anglo-Saxon culture. And we think this is not the case because English already detached from the Anglo-Saxon culture. It is, it is attached to a global culture. It's not anymore, it's not anymore, it's not anymore about Mark Twain, it's not anymore about Shakespeare, it's about airport English, it's about the English which we speak on the stock market, it's about it's about the language on which we understand each other when we go out there and when we have to communicate with people coming from different countries and coming from different cultural backgrounds. And, why, and why, why was it English able to do so? Because it had a political power which backed it up. It had an incentive for people. People had an interest in learning English. How? Because, because and, and I can talk about here on many points, but for instance, the, we know that the US economy is the biggest one. So basically, if you know the English language, there is a direct interest there doing, in doing business with, with, with people from the biggest economy of the world. And, for this sole reason, because you have, as a person, a person that interest in speaking the language so you can understand each other, so you can bis do business together with people coming from different backgrounds, and because it, it, this happens because you have a political power which backs the language up, then you can, then you can have an incentive to learn. And the same goes to, and the same goes to, to, the, to the culture, I think. And here I would like to draw on the analogy of, of Google Plus versus Facebook. Why Google Plus is not successful? And why is everyone on Facebook? Because Facebook were there from the beginning and people were already on Facebook and Google Plus just didn't manage to attract people from Facebook to join them. And this is the same with English and Esperanto because people were speaking English because English was already entrenched. You cannot just introduce something from the scratch and attract people to, work, to, to, to speak in this language. And English already by, 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 by now is the English is the language of technology, English is the language of internet, English is the language of technological innovation, and it's also the language of science. I don't know, like 90% of scientific literature, of, of articles, of, 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 of every good book which appears is written in English. And if you want to keep in track with this, you have to, you have to speak the language. And, and, and this is something which truly shows, because if there is a global community now, this is the scientific community, right? And if the scientific community picks the language as their language, it means that it's, it's something which is not linked to the Anglo-Saxon culture, because scholars from all over the world speak this language and produce their thought in this language. So because, because language comes with culture, because English doesn't mean just simply the Anglo-Saxon culture, but it went much beyond that, because it has a political power which backs this up, because you have incentives to learn this, because people have an interest if you want to be successful and if, you want, if they want to prove themselves in different areas of life to speak English, we truly, we truly beg you to oppose this motion. So, I'm going to talk about is why do people learn certain languages and what stops people from learning languages that are important for them? 
I'm going to talk about how learning Esperanto will actually improve the access of all the freedoms we can imagine. And I'm also going to talk about power relations in today's societies how, and how transit with power relationships are incredibly impactful when it comes to language acquisition and the, the, the model we have so far is not sustainable. But first, some point of the point of the book. I'll start with an example. So we were told that the reason for why Facebook is more successful than uh, Google Plus is because Facebook was there first. Well, let me tell you something. Before Facebook, we had MySpace. Everyone was on MySpace. So Facebook is not the most successful thing out there because it was the first one to be. MySpace was there before Facebook. MySpace died because Facebook was better. So from this perspective, it's not being first that matters, it's being the best at what you're doing. And why is Esperanto in our debate the best? Because Esperanto was designed as an experiment in which linguists all around the world, uh, the world gathered words from the languages out there that would be one, why? easy to understand, easy to understand Easy to, to, to put from a grammar perspective. One of the most difficult things when it comes to learning language is the grammar side of it. The linguists behind that project made it so in such a way that actually learning it would be very easy for everyone. But besides that, the vocabulary of the Esperanto language captures all the cultural aspects that the opposition keeps talking about because it takes the words from all the cultures around the world because it makes sure that words like door in Romanian will be translated to, to, to Esperanto but they're not in English because you don't capture them. So Esperanto is better because it captures cultural uh, features that the English as a hegemonic now, a language nowadays it doesn't. So all those cultural elements actually fall on the government side of the Esperanto project. I'll take closing. If, if Esperanto is so great, how come it already failed? Or okay, AJ talked about this. The reason for why Esperanto failed so far is because it was a pure linguistic project. So what do we want to do with the first level? We want to make Esperanto a political project. What does that mean? That means having a lot of resources into it. That means that when it comes to second language acquisition for people around the world, people will take this into the curriculum. Because guess what? A lot of resources go in second language acquisition all around the world. We just want to have it part of the curriculum. We don't think it would be that expensive, but if it would be, we should do it. And the political element of it would make it more successful in the second join it in the first level. Now, the, 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 next, the next thing we have talked about is the fact that we have portrayed as, uh, as this is a debate between language, uh, uh, English and Esperanto as, as a language that we should have as a common language. We don't think that learning Esperanto will stop people from learning English if they want to do that. We think that's perfectly okay. But we think that English as itself is a language of hegemonic culture. It's a language in which it's not, it doesn't portray the local culture that people want, uh, the, uh, the closing uh, opening opposition wants to talk about because duh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It was a colonial language to begin with. It, it, it went into transfer cultural element of the English world to other other parts of the world. It wasn't there to take into account cultural experiences from, from the local people to begin with. So we have a huge colonial part of this and this translates me to my own my first substantive. So why don't there, people learn uh, why don't people in North Korea learn English as, as a second language? And this has to do with the fact that English has a colonial past to begin with. English has has is a representative of a culture to begin with. Why is Esperanto different? If Esperanto is different because 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 it has a less of a hegemonic uh, 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 component to it, because it's less associated with the hegemonic power and more associated with the feature of a language of communication. And this this a good example for this is why is debate learned in China? Debate is learned in China not because it promotes critical thinking. And it's not so as because it promotes critical thinking as it is in Europe. It is so because it promotes language acquisition. So from this perspective, you can always say and tell it to anyone out there that doesn't have that has a problem with the U.S. being a hegemon actor that you don't learn Esperanto because the U.S. is conquering you. You learn Esperanto because you want to communicate. So a lot of places that wouldn't have the capacity of learning the, uh, hegemonic language because of their political implications will actually learn Esperanto. That's why you have more people learning this second language than English. Because and not not to say just more people, but people that are more important and are not reachable by English to begin with in our society. So, from this perspective, we actually do manage to put this language as a second language in more context than nowadays would provide. But it's more important to think about the, the, relation, the power relations in today's society and their connection to language. The, the reason for why English is one of the lingua francas in today's society is because uh, the U.S. is so important economically speaking. But what we see in today's society is that we don't, we, we're moving from one hegemonic player to a one in which we have many hegemonic players. So there's a lot of discussion about China being an important actor. There's a lot of discussion about Brazil being an important actor. Everyone talks about Africa becoming very important when it comes to the economic growth. <coughs> so what does that mean? It means that you, as a language learner, have to already have to learn four or five languages. So it's not that just it would be enough for you to learn English to be able to communicate with, communicate with everyone that's important in the world. And we think that's very bad to learn English just because you have to learn from 
You have to communicate with who's important in the world. You have to learn Portuguese to be able to compete on the Brazilian <coughs> market. You have to learn French or English to be able to compete on the African market. You have to learn Russian to be able to work in Kyrgyzstan if you want to do that, or Chinese or Mandarin if you want to work in China. That's unsustainable for our limited brain capacity. Right? So in that perspective, it's not just <laughs> mine also. So from this perspective, it's not, it's not sustainable to imagine that a world in which we only have a language, uh, uh, English is a language, is sustainable long term. We have to take into account this transition between powers. We've seen that in history, right? When French became less dominant, the, 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 we switched from having French to German. Those transitions are incredibly important. Having a language that's more neutral is more important than taking now. If you say that uh, English is hegemonic for the US, you have to prove us, you have the burden of proof of showing how the US is gaining from it. No, I don't. I don't have the I don't have the burden of restating facts of everyone. If, well, actually, AJ did that in his speech because whenever you have an interaction between a native speaker and a non-native speaker, the native speaker will, will, will have will have an advantage because if if an, if, if an English person goes to China, he or she will always have a job in terms of teaching English. If I go from Romania to China, although I speak decent English, I won't get that job. So there are lots of advantages that come from that, and it comes also with portraying culture because the culture of English is not the culture of Shakespeare; it's a culture of Housewives or whatever shows there in the US nowadays. So those are another hegemonic elements of it. But importantly also is the fact that all the other freedoms we have would be enhanced. We talk about freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of healthcare. Imagine myself as an individual who doesn't speak the local language going to a place like North Korea, if I could do that, and actually do that. So if I don't want to have access to healthcare right there, which is a fundamental right I have, because I don't speak the language they speak because they don't really learn English there because of the hegemonic power of English nowadays, I couldn't do that. But if I do have learn this ground, I can have access to basic things that are already enhanced for me. Freedom of movement is something I would like to talk about. But if I go to a place and no one can talk to me in the same language, we also think that those freedoms are, are restricted if we don't have the, the proper language capacity of learning. Because we do want to have this as a political project, which will make it work the second time we try it. Because we think there are a lot of advantages and it's unsustainable to have hegemonic language many technological powers to be the way we learn language so we beg you to propose and don't worry. Thank you Mr. Speaker. We all agree here that there are benefits to having a common language. This is not what is disputed. What is disputed is how, what is the best way to get to those benefits of a common language. And what we say is that, uh, and what I'm going to talk to you and what I'm going to bring you to you is that a difference between natural languages such as English and artificial invented languages such as Esperanto. And how these artificial invented languages are structurally deficient and cannot and will not spread. But before uh, I'll go into that, let me uh, just tackle a few points. So. Uh, I think a major clash was this thing of uh, whether it's hegemonic or not. And I do think that they have the burden of proof to show how this helps the U.S. Because that's what they're claiming. They're claiming it's a hegemonic language. That's where it's helping, it's helping someone. Well, we say it's not helping anyone. It's not helping the U.S. more than anybody else. And this is what the opposition has been telling you. That English that right now is a global language. English right now is connected to global culture. It's not helping anyone more than anybody else. Look at, for example, uh, it, and it's managed to do so the globe the same way the U.S. managed to make American English its own, as, a, as opposed from British English. We, the same, in the same way, we've managed, the world has managed to make what we call airport English, it, which is not connected and is, does not present any benefits uh, to, US, uh, to the U.S. or the U.K. for that matter. Now, we, we've also heard this thing that you have in business, you might have an advantage when negotiating. Well, we believe this is not the case. What's important in business or in uh, diplomatic negotiations is your country's power, the power of your contract, all these things that matter so much more than translation. I mean, let's, let's be serious about this. We've also heard the example of uh, being a native speaker and going to China. Well, it's, they don't want native speakers to teach them English. They want people who know good English, people who know grammar uh, and, and know all the intricacies of the language. And if, uh, for that, you, you can go as a Romanian to China if you know English well enough. Uh, now, we've also heard this thing that uh, debate is being, is being uh, developed in China uh, just for learning the language. And this is precisely what we're saying. They're, they're learning English through debate. Uh, and we're getting all these benefits, but we're learning English and not an artificial language because English is spreading naturally. Um, and I guess we'll, with that, I'm going to go uh, to my substantive, namely the difference between natural languages and invented languages. And uh, the government has also failed to prove to us why they're choosing Esperanto over other invented languages. Let me give you the example of Ifquil, which, was, which can be considered actually better than Esperanto. It's the most efficient language that uses the least number of letters for expressing things. It is the most expressive language because you can express anything from intonation to sarcasm in the language, and it's the most logical and easy to learn. 
However, this, has, this language has failed even more than Esperanto. Why? Because people don't uh, go for logical languages. They don't go for these efficient languages. They go for natural languages. And this is the, this is the difference uh, between the two. You don't learn a language through dictionaries. You don't have the incentive to learn a language through dictionaries and investing money, but through culture, because languages are attached to cultures. Think of the Slavic languages. Each of the Slavic languages has been adapted to its to its own culture. They've been expanded with religion. They've been expanded to uh, to meet local needs. And this is what this is what is so good about natural languages that they can evolve to meet uh, the needs of the people uh, they serve. They they evolve with the culture of the language. And this is. Like I said, this is the main mechanism through which language is transmitted, through culture. And this is what we're telling you, that we already have this global culture and that, uh, that has been attached to English, and this is already spreading. So, in the first case, this structurally deficient language cannot spread because it's, 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 land, it's staying on thin air. It's, it's, it's not attached to anything. Uh, now, second of all, this language can also uh, not... not um, not catch on for the, for the, for the reason um, um, uh, my colleagues say, namely that everybody is already using English. And we, we don't want, why should we invest all, all of these resources, all of these new materials into language when we already have an international language? There is no need for it. And they mentioned this, that why, why has Esperanto failed before? Oh, because it was just a linguistic project, now we're going to make it a political project. Well, how are you going to manage to gather the political will to do something when we already have the international language? when we would require so many, so many more uh, resources to do it. We see that this language is completely useless because it's, first, so first of all, it's completely useless because we already have a, a global language. Second of all, it will not have the same, uh, uh, the same power to, uh, to develop itself as English does. Top down, it will never work in languages. You won't, you will never manage to implement uh, a language. I'll take you in a second. You'll never manage to, to implement a language from the top down. You only manage to implement the language through the, through the, through the incentives that we mentioned and through culture. Yes. If we would have a community of people out there in the world that would have their Esperanto as, as a native language, will have all the culture that the, the opposition uh, proposes uh, a language to be connected to. Would you agree to teach us a second language, a language of that community that can be proclaimed as a country to everyone in the world? Well, you don't you don't teach the language of that culture, uh, the language of that country, because that country has its own culture. We want a language for the globe because we have a global culture. English is the, the language of globalization, and this is why uh, we're implementing it now. Uh, let me get back to the incentives part. People learn English because we have incentives, and this is our big problem with the government's case. They just assume that everyone's going to learn this new language out of thin air just because there's some, there might or might not be some political will. But people don't just learn the language because they, they get taught the language in school. They learn the language because it provides them advantages. I learned English because I could go to uh, foreign universities, and I don't have to go to the U.S. I'm here in Hungary learning in English. I learn English because I can also debate in English, and I've raised this also in my POI. So we have this whole host of incentives that fly with, with English, and we've, we've been presenting no incentive on the, on the individual level uh, to um, actually take you, uh, to learn this language. Or do you have such incentives? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, do we actually have a problem with second language acquisition? Because in our model, we would have all the first languages that we would begin with, and we would just have to teach people another language. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, they have no incentive. Second of all, we already have a second language, which is English, and we have the structure for it to develop even more. This is why so many people learn English. Of course, we're going to keep uh, all the first languages, but this is the status quo. We have first language, and we also have the second language, which is English. So, again, this language it will not work because it will fail structurally. It's a language connected to nothing that means nothing to no one. There are no incentives to learn this language, no, there are no individual incentives, and there are no political incentives because we already have these problems solved. We, everyone knows English or can talk even in French. We don't have necessarily have to make it about English. We have, we have translators and so on, and we don't see the political will to spend this money. We don't see the individual motivation to learn this language. Because this language is structurally deficient, which is why it failed in the first Place, which is why all other artificial languages fail. There is no example of an artificial language making it its way to any culture in the world because these two co-evolve, they co-evolve and co-evolve. So for these reasons, we don't need it, and it's not going to work. We will oppose this motion. Thank you. Uh, we agree a lot with the last speaker that there is a global culture and there is a global world. And unfortunately, if you go 
think that English and American culture should be the culture that dominates that global world. We think it's much more complicated than that. And for those reasons, while our opening government talked to you a lot about the harms of the culture of English in particular, Rob and I want to talk to you about a global culture and the best way to build that uh, with, most, with the most stability, uh, the most growth and prosperity, and the least amount of conflict. And we think that we can do that the best through Esperanto. So I want to talk to you about one main point. I'm just going to really flush this point out and give you some points and stuff along the way. And that's growing a global culture and how best to do that. Before I get into that point, though, a little bit of rebuttal on some of the things we got from the opening opposition. So their main point uh, is that you cannot learn a language without a shared history, some kind of shared past and culture uh, to connect to. Um, and that's really something that they really stress a lot. Uh, you need something to attach it to. And the important thing here is that and I'm going to talk about this a lot in my positive matter, uh, we have this global culture and nothing to attach it to, which is why English and American culture have attached themselves to the global culture. We find that particularly problematic. We don't think that that's helpful for, to everybody. We think it's not necessarily a language that reflects global uh, culture. It's simply a language that reflects American dominance, and to be quite frank, like, come on, that sucks. Uh, so, but the second thing that they talk about a lot uh, is that basically artificial languages are never going to work and that's just because they're not real and you can't attach them to anything and there's no example of any artificial language that's ever worked. Well, there's still two million Esperanto speakers in the world after actually a pretty sad attempt, right, at making people learn this language. So I think with more funding and more political backing uh, and a greater globalized world than there was at first when Esperanto first came out, um, I think there's more interest in this. There's going to be a lot more uh, 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 care towards actually trying to resolve this kind of issue. Uh, so, sure, there aren't any examples. Here's one now. We're going to make one. We think it's about yeah. time, right? But the second thing they talked about, and this is kind of funny because they really just like whine about the model a lot. They're like, there's no need for this. It's going to cost too much money. There's not going to be a political flow for this. First of all, I think they should engage in the principles that our opening team brought you and that we're going to bring you to the back half. But beyond that, what we're going to tell you is, you know what? It might cost a lot of money. We think it's totally worth it. Beyond that, we think it's an investment in an industry, which is actually going to help apply to the multiplier effect. We think you're going to give more teachers jobs. You're going to give more book uh, uh, companies more books to print. More people are going to buy these things. More money is going to have to circulate through the economy. So yeah, you might have to put up a little bit amount of money, but we think it's going to be worth it. Beyond that, we think that giving this a common language to global business is probably going to make things a lot easier. So yeah, it might cost a little bit of money. Uh, we think it's going to help uh, kind of balance out in the long run. Uh, so that's basically that. Uh, on to positive matter, point of information for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about resources and governments investing into this language. Why would governments such as the U U.S. or the U.K. be interested in investing in Esperanto when they already have English and benefit from that? Uh, I think that's ultimately because I can come to Hungary and literally not understand anything except the word pineapples. <laughs> like, swear to God. Honestly, like... People aren't, like, right. English is not a language that everyone speaks here. I definitely got extraordinarily lost on the metro trying to find my way because the woman I bought a ticket from didn't speak English. Right. If she spoke Esperanto, if I didn't require to speak Esperanto, right. I think that traveling would be easier, that these transactions that help the local economy here would be easier. Uh, and this is just one of many examples that could potentially happen. So, like, I think the U.S. government, right. um, and also the U.S. kind of gets in a lot of trouble because they think everyone speaks English and then there's a lot of conflict and the U.S. kind of turns out to look like assholes. Happens a lot. So, uh, growing a global culture, we think that this is pretty important because, uh, no thank you, I just took one. Uh, there's a vast amount of different cultures in the world, a vast amount of different languages, uh, and they differ so extraordinarily much. There's so many differences in people, right? And the thing is, is that these differences in cultures, they're important, and they have a lot of value to people as individuals. Uh, but what we've noticed lately in last, the last 20 years is that these cultures are kind of glowing, glowing growing closer together um, and, and every year, right? We see the fact that we're dealing with a lot more global issues all of the time now. We're dealing with things like global issues. We're dealing with things with, like global spread of disease. We're dealing with things like global economics and trade. We're dealing with things like global internet governance, right? That there are so many issues that are now affecting people um, that there is a global history. There is a global <coughs> culture that really does unite people, that everybody has had to deal with things like the bird flu, that everybody has had to deal with things like censorship of videos in Libya because the videos came out of the United States, ladies and gentlemen. These are things that really do cross cultures and cross borders in a way that they did not necessarily used to. We think it's vastly important to recognize this global history, to recognize this global culture that is developing, and embrace it in a way that's going to lead to less culture, and uh, lead to less conflict, excuse me, and lead to more prosperity. Because what the difficult thing has been in the modern era of communication is that we have this new culture, these new issues, and these new problems forming, and we don't have a language that reflects that kind of culture. Because we agree with 
the opening opposition. That language should reflect culture. Language should reflect history. And we have all of this culture and all of this history and no language to reflect it because the Americans think that they own the world. It's time to change that. Um, and we think that what Esperanto does is Esperanto is literally a language that was created to express and reflect this global culture. And we think that for those reasons, uh, we desperately need it. Why? We think that we desperately need it because language exists to give people a shared meaning, a shared context, a shared understanding of the world, uh, and most conflict, both individually and internationally, right, comes out of the fact that people lack context and lack shared meaning in certain types of situations. And what we think that happens then is that in the modern world, right, when we have the news media is reporting in English, but it was a story that broke in China, um, and it was first like exported to Turkey, and it's been going through these different languages. Uh, first and foremost, this is extraordinarily difficult. Context is often taken very far out of place. Uh, and beyond that, it, it does result in a lot of issues that deal with two main things that I think is a very universal issue. And these are conflict, uh, and these are business. Because we think lacking understanding, as understanding and a shared meaning uh, really does lead to a significant amount of conflict and a significant amount of hampering in the business arena in the modern day. Why is this problematic, right? We're talking about conflict that comes out of the fact that uh, people don't necessarily have languages that they can necessarily use at EU meetings. We're talking about conflict in, uh, in the sense um, that the shared currency in the Eurozone might be significantly more successful as it is in the United States. We have the fact that all of these people spoke a single language. They don't. Immigration to other countries is harder for this. The shared currency is harder because of these things, and it's therefore harder for individual nations to integrate and become uh, closer to each other. And that does result in a lot of conflict. It does result in a lot of ten uh, tension between places like uh, Greece and Germany, per se, right? Because of these types of issues that come up. We think uh, what then happens is that it's a lot like speaking uh, telephone, playing the game telephone. And we ultimately think um, that this is something that all people learn as well, right? As far as cult conflict is concerned, um, this is something that everybody's going to learn. It's not being forced to learn American culture. It's not being forced to learn French culture. This is something that everybody's going to learn and that everybody's going to understand. And we think there's less resentment and more understanding in the world. And we think we should always stand for those kinds of things. Thank you. Okay. Lots of problems with this. Case. Um, but first, let's announce your final extension. I'm going to talk about how there's no need and no supply for this language, how it will realistically create the language war, and further, all, what is this culture thing and what are we going to do with it? And yeah, that, 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 I haven't named it yet. Okay. But first of all, they don't really give us a model. We're not, we, we don't, and there's confusion between the two teams. Um, the second half tells us that a lot of stuff gets lost in translation from China to Turkey to whatever. Everything's going to be translated anyway unless everybody becomes native, which we don't think is going to happen because people like their languages. And if they lose all their local languages, that's going to kill their own culture. And when we oppose that, if, if everybody's going to be a second-hand speaker like I am and just speak it as a second language, some of them will know less Esperanto, some of them will know more Esperanto. Exactly like with English, there's going to be differences in contracts and differences in EU meetings and whatever, but if my president can speak a, a bit of English, which he doesn't, he's going to just get a guy to translate, and a guy that is almost native, which we really don't think is worth putting a lot of high school kids through the torture of learning a whole new language that there is no movie, no cartoon in. No. <laughs> okay. They work on the presumption that everyone is going to learn this language. This is wrong. People cling to their own language, and people cling to the things that they already know, and that already work. Esperanto already failed. Nobody really wants to. Those two, two million people that already learned it have lost a lot of time in their lives and can't really even go to the movies, and we're sad for them, and we hope that they can be revived. No okay. Okay, uh, we've, we've come so far with English, there's no point in going back. Oh, but, oh by the way, about the he hegemonic point, Esperanto is based on Spanish and Portuguese. No idea why we should go into Spanish, into languages language that I from Spain and Portuguese. I would have loved this line, this motion, sit down. I would have loved this motion to be about Elvish or something, at least, a, or Klingon or something a little, <laughs> bit, something a little bit more uh, original, but it is. So, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the extension that, they, oh yeah, and by the way, the people in North Korea don't, won't learn Esperanto either because they're naturally resistant to anything coming from outside except nuclear bombs. So, okay, let's move on. Uh, new uh, opposition extent, government extension. 
Um, the English, we don't have a language that, is, that defines the culture of the world. Yes, we do. It's English. And it will still, and even if we change the language, the culture will still be the same because the, the culture is not given by the language to, uh, to, the, uh, to the whole world. It's given by the movies that we watch, the, the books that we read, the things that we think, the debates that we fought. And if, even if we change it, America is still going to do most of the movies, uh, and write most of the books and all that, and that's going to define the culture more than any sort of change in language. Okay, going on to my, going on to my extension. First of all, we don't, uh, if you don't speak, in, we believe that if you don't speak English at, at this point, like the guy, like the woman that uh, my colleague tried to buy a ticket from, you won't speak Esperanto either. Because the <laughs> English is being taught at an international level in every freaking school in Europe at this point. If you haven't learned English, you're, you, you either don't want to learn English, or you are physically incapable of learning English, or you just don't care about learning English. That means you won't care about learning Esperanto. I don't think the normal the, the normal person on the street doesn't learn English because, oh no, it's a hegemon. And I, I very much doubt this. I think they're just either lazy or can't do it. Okay. So let's go on to how there is, the first half tackle the fact that there is no supply for this. That when we were asking about resources, it's not because we want to point at them and say, hey, it's going to be expensive, it's going to cost more. No, but we want, we want to say that there is no one to teach this language. There is no one, there will take a whole lot of time and there will be massive, massive differences between how much Esperanto people from Spain know because it's similar to their own language, between how much Esperanto Russians know because it's totally different. Okay. Going on to need, there is no need for this language. We already have a lingua franca, which is by the way, lingua franca, it means or universal language or something like that. The, the emphasis being on language G, a singular thing, which we already sort of have. And what, what, but as they said, we already have more. We, and we see no point in introducing another one because it will create a language war, which I'm going to talk about now as my. Oh, actually, yeah, go. Lingua franca is a Latin word. Uh, stands for, for language and speech. How do you do this in a situation where the power plays change the world and have to learn five languages at the same time to be able to thanks. work on the market? Thanks, thanks, thanks. No country will ever renounce their own language. Everybody will still learn their own language as a native language. People will just shift from learning, and people will be, I don't know, maybe equally disadvantaged and not understand, and it will be really hard for everyone to communicate because everybody will be Esperanto speaker level, maybe. I don't understand why this is okay, especially since it's harder to learn, since there's no support for it. There are no movies, there are no books, there are no nothing. And, and just punishing the English people, just, that, that, I don't know, the second half is telling you that, oh no, we're going to make a lot of money because we're going to publish a lot of books and translate a lot of movies. Yeah, but that's going to take a lot of money from the people that are already publishing them in English. Why are we punishing them? We don't know. Okay, moving on. Language war. Some will learn it, some will not. This will create a language war, exactly like now they're saying that some people only know French, some people only know Portuguese, some people only know English. They say that this is a problem. Again, we say that this will be the same problem with Esperanto because realistically speaking, not every country is going to say, okay, buddy. If you have a model that says we're going to put it in a political context, like a political project, we don't think this is strong enough. We've received no sort of proof, no sort of reason for why these people are going to want to learn this language and not Elvish or whatever. No. Um, okay, so, um, creating this language war is going to kill um, uh, global communication, it's going to destroy it even more. Because now it's uh, say that there are five major languages, and now there's going to be six. So the difference is, is going to be that there are a lot of different ways of talking about it, and I'm going to have a, a lesser chance of meeting somebody that speaks English, because there's also people wasting their time learning Esperanto, which no one speaks. Okay, first of all, let's talk about how and why do people learn languages. Second half wants you to believe that they learn languages because they're attached to a culture. And that's somehow true. But the culture is not derived from the language itself. The culture has been put through through the ideas that the people in those countries made. And the, the fundamental ideas right now are sort of like westernized things that are mostly transmitted in English. And the culture has been already defined. It, learning Esperanto and translating everything, in every, every housewife's movie or whatever into Esperanto is not going to change the culture. It's going to be the same culture, just in another language. We don't see why we should do this. 
Culture is defined by the things that people perceive and that have in their minds. Our minds don't necessarily think in languages, they think in impulses, in dialectical impulses. And those impulses are going to say the same things. Now, please vote against this motion because, first of all, nobody will speak. Esperanto is going to create a language war and it's just going to be harder for everyone to, I don't know, try to date people in other countries. Thank you. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, as, as the Speaker of Closing Opposition mentioned, English is a lingua franca and that's the problem. It's a lingua franca, not a lingua universa or whatever the Latin word for that is. English is everyone's second language, some people's third language. Esperanto, under our model, as specifically mentioned by the opening government, is going to be everyone's co-mother tongue. And the reason why it's going to be everyone's co-mother tongue is it's, it's going to have a self-perpetuating process, which I'll get to later. At the end of this debate, we on side proposition would like to ask three questions. What effect is this going to have on the global culture? Secondly, what effect is this going to have on communication? And lastly, what effect is this going to have on global power structures? The most important point of clash that we've identified in this debate is global culture. Because as was mentioned, um, that first of all, Esperanto is just a simply better language to learn. Right? It, 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 it identifies with cultural aspects and cultural elements from many different languages as opposed to just one or two, which is, uh, which is what the English currently identifies with. It's culturally superior. There are two million speakers of Esperanto in the world, including native speakers numbering the hundreds, which came from inbreeding of Esperanto speakers. <coughs> right? There's poetry, there's literature, there's even a Wikipedia in Esperanto that contains over 100,000 articles, believe it or not, more than the Wikipedia in Latin, and more than the Wikipedia in any other uh, an artificial language which answers all their questions of why Esperanto and why not any other language, just look at Wikipedia. Other artificial languages, under 1,000. Esperanto, over 100,000. Also in the global culture. Now, Melanie mentioned to you a lot of good points. Sit down, all of you. Melanie mentioned to you a lot of good points about global issues that, that in this day and age affect us all collectively as opposed to all of us individually. There are diseases such as the bird flu. There are lots of issues of international relations that could be avoided were it not for unfortunate miscommunications but aren't avoided because people still cling to their individual languages with which they identify with their individual culture that automatically creates a form of otherization. We think Esperanto will be a major, major step to, to finally getting rid of that. The reason why English hasn't, has, hasn't been able to do that is because it's got a fundamentally um, uh, colonial, imperialistic, slash, slash hegemonistic uh, connotation. In India, for instance, after, after, after Britain left India in 1947, the Indian parliament passed a resolution saying they want to get rid of English within the next 15 years because it's a colonial language, it's not India's language. The, the fact that they were unable to do so is irrelevant, they had no other choice, but it does show their intentions. They did want to get rid of English, they did want to speak it in the same way that if you go to Paris, the French don't want to speak English either. If you go to any country with even a, a slightly strong uh, sense of nationalism, they don't want to speak English. It, it does carry uh, a connotation of, of one particular culture, whereas Esperanto was originally designed to, to to bind together different cultures. So, yes. Can you, as the last speaker of the government, tell us why would people learn Esperanto in the first place? What are the incentives in work here? I'll get to that later. So, um, in, this, in this day and age, there's a lot of shared meaning and shared understanding. Melanie told you some really good material about international news stories, for instance, and how a lot is lost in translation. To that, um, the um, opposing opposition speaker said that you know, there's still a lot lost in translation because um, because you know it's everyone's a second speaker anyway under our model. Well, to that we say that the difference between English and Esperanto is, as I just mentioned, English is everyone's second language and only the second language of those who actually learn it. Whereas Esperanto is, and under our model is going to be sort of like a co-mother tongue because everyone's going to learn it. Fact of the matter is, the reason why someone who did learn English will now learn Esperanto is because that person could only communicate with the portion of the world that they learn English in. The benefits of learning Esperanto are going to be much higher. Let's not forget that there used to be a different global language at some point in the world. It used to be French. English came and replaced French. The decline of French as a global language which much, was much, much quicker than the rise of French as a global language. So it was a very steep hill, and the reason for that is it has negative feedback. Once fewer and fewer people start learning it, once people see that there's a better, culturally superior language out there that can be a global language, more and more people start learning it. And it's an exponential process like that because it contains positive feedback, which is a self-perpetuating process. 
And that's the very reason why Esperanto, uh, Esperanto is going to be learned, even by people who don't who haven't bothered to learn English, because they're going to see that hey, it's a superior language, and because of the vastly more number of people already who will, by that time, be speaking Esperanto, they will choose to learn English, <coughs> to choose to learn Esperanto instead. Another. Another aspect of this global culture that Melanie mentioned to you is conflict. There is a lot of conflict in this world that could be avoided had it not been for the fact that um, we speak so, such vastly different languages and like to cling to our languages. It's not the fact that we speak different languages, it's the fact that we hold national, nationalistic sentiments attached to those languages. That's the very reason why MEPs, MEPs from, from, from France refuse to speak English in the European Parliament, even though a lot more people understand them in English uh, than in French. That's the very reason why MEPs from all across Europe who speak English sometimes speak, uh, 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 most of the time choose to speak their mother tongue, right? And, and that's the very reason why, contrary to what opening opposition mentioned, this is factually incorrect, MEPs don't speak in English or French. There are 732 interpreters in the European Parliament. They're there for a reason. They're there because they, MEPs used to speak in their mother tongue. They don't choose to speak in English and French. That causes a host of misunderstanding. With 700 interpreters, something's bound to get lost in translation, and you wonder why the Euro is in such deep trouble. Point. Point. And, and which, bring, which, which brings me to my next point about the Eurozone. The Eurozone is a shared currency union, and one of the mo most important aspects of any currency union is labor movement. The, uh, that would that, that, that would that would neutralize differences between uh, between different parts of the currency. And the fact that Greeks can't move to Germany because of linguistic barriers would be solved under this model. Another example of global culture: the ISS. Multiple languages were involved in construction of the ISS, which resulted in several mis miscommunications, with occasionally tragic consequences because the Russians were just too arrogant to learn English properly. Second point of clash here: communication. Um, the, the, uh, one, of, one, of the main, uh, one of the main problems that opposition seems to have with Esperanto is not spreading naturally, it's a logical language, quote unquote, that's what they said. It's not a logical, it's not purely logical, it integrates cultural elements from seven different languages from all across the planet. And people want a natural language, but more than that, people want a language that reflects their culture, that reflects their common heritage as global citizens. The advantage of um, English, um, Okay, I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, third, third point of clash regarding power structures. Um, we currently live in a we currently live in a multipolar world, a world, which means that we can't afford to learn the languages of all the different rising powers. And for that reason, I think Esperanto is going to get rid of the nationalistic sentiment, incentivize people to learn it more than it has incentivized than people can incentivize to learn English, self perpetuating process. For all these reasons, we're going to try to Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, we say that if we promote Esperanto, which is a language, as my colleague explained, based on Spanish and Portuguese, we're going to have both government teams in a debate 10 years from now saying that Spanish culture and Portuguese culture are taking over the world. We should stop promoting Esperanto, we should find something else. A truly neutral language which is unlike Latin, unlike English, and unlike Esperanto. But, and to that end, I have four points for you today. First of all, I'm going to talk about the, mod the model that the government has put forward in this debate. Then I'm going to talk about their problems with English. English being a hegemonic language, which is taking over the world because it's associated with a particular Anglo-Saxon culture. Then I'm going to talk about the benefits in terms of communication that they say that Esperanto will actually bring. Then I'm going to, and then I'm going to move on to the extension which the second opposition has actually brought to the table with refers to the fact that there's no need for Esperanto to, to be actually promoted by investing vast amounts of resources into it, and the fact that it would actually be harmful to do so because it generates that language word that my colleague talk, talked about. So on to their model. What they basically said is that Esperanto, this failed project which has already been given a chance and which has been unsuccessful, must be restarted by governments of the world coming together, international organizations, uh, collaborating in order to pump resources into it and in order to make it truly successful. But we have two points of rebuttal uh, which the opposition has brought to this point. First of all, and they, because they rely on governments, we think that A, powerful governments such as those of the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and even India and other English speaking countries will have absolutely no interest in investing vast amounts of resources, which, as I will explain in the fourth point of the speech, are necessary because we need a whole, uh, an enormous amount of infrastructure in order to promote Esperanto to the level that they want us to promote it. And secondly, we say that governments of other countries, so, so say for example North Korea, that the first government told us about, or China, have absolutely no interest in 
into investing into a language which will allow their population to actually becoming engaged in a sort of global discourse and global political culture because they have an interest in keeping themselves isolated and promote, investing loads of money in the Esperanto would surely go against their policies. So now moving on to the second point, the problems that they have with English. They told us that English is hegemonic because there's an inextricable link between Anglo-Saxon culture and English. We say that's not true. And we heard from the last speaker of the, of the government that actually in India in, 19, in the 1940s there has been an attempt for English to be actually taken out of the country. We say, well, we see that today English has actually been embraced by India. And Indians are, promote, are producing films in Bollywood, which are Indian movies, completely unlike Hollywood movies in English. They're producing Indian music in English, and that shows that culture can actually be played in another language than, than, that, than your native tongue. We think that there's no such inextricable necessary nexus between English and the certain culture. We think that regional cultures can actually develop and be put into English because simply because many people understand them. And secondly, as my colleague explained, it's not the language which generates a particular culture and which promotes it, but it's actually money. If we're going to promote this brand, if it's, if it's going to be actually be truly successful as the government of the government actually wants it to be, it will still be U.S. movies that we will be watching on TV and we will still be listening to U.S. music, but it will just be in Esperanto and not in English. How does that make a difference? It will still be the culture of powerful countries, of rich countries, which have the actual necessary resources in order to invest into promoting their culture that we will continuously be exposed to. And this global culture can develop into English because, as I have already explained, there's no necessary nexus between in, be, between a certain language and culture. We think that any culture can be put into any language, but before that. Right, basically every speech on their bench has been a model attack about why we like could not do this, and I really think it's time for them to engage in the principle of why we should do this for the global citizenry okay. and the global progress that all of us talk uh, about. Yeah, you just interrupted me from doing that, so now moving on to, to my following point, which refers to the, com to the benefits in communication, to the enhanced level of communication that they allege as parental reality bring. And they're talking about business and politics and about the fact that we have native and non-native speakers of English. Well, as my colleague quite rightly explained, we're going to have native light speakers of Esperanto, people who speak Esperanto better than others, and these imbalance, in, imbalances in power relationship will still subsist in, uh, if we promote Esperanto. And furthermore, they talked about politics and business, so wow, what, what a large problem we have in the European Union with all these interpreters. Well, we don't really see the problem. I mean, if we're going to have Esperanto, we don't assume that everybody will learn it to a satisfactory enough level to actually conduct business and politics efficiently into, the, into that language. We think that we're we're still going to need translators and we don't really see a problem with that. Furthermore, as I was explaining in, the, in relation to our extension, we already have English and we've gone so far into actually promoting this language and making sure that each and every children in high schools across Europe and across increasingly across the world has actually uh, the, the opportunity to learn English and we're continually exposed to it. We already have this lingua franca, we don't need any other uh, to that end. Yes? We have this lingua franca today and they're concerned about um, the loss of a language. It could be China if we follow the fatalistic natural progression. Okay, okay, so okay. are we with Esperanto? Well, 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 we're going to have the same risks in terms of loss of language if we promote Esperanto as a global language too. We don't see why having English as the lingua franca as opposed to Esperanto entails <coughs> more of a risk than if we just promote Esperanto. And in order to respond to the point made by the second uh, government speaker who has actually told us that she's, she can't to Hungary and she can't understand shit because she doesn't speak the language. But it's going to be the same with Esperanto. I mean, it's not like, it's like Javier is going to stop speaking Hungarian and suddenly switch to Esperanto. We're going to have similar problems that, to the ones that we have today with English. Now, moving on to our, model, to our extension, which refers to the fact that there's no need to promote Esperanto because we've already gone so far with English. We are already exposed to English. We have debating competitions in English. We have movies in English, music in English, and, and also English teachers. In order to create a similar level of infrastructure, in order to promote Esperanto, we would need to have an enormous amount of resources pumped into this process, which, as I have already explained in relation to the model, is not realistic to expect government of the world to provide. And secondly, we think that creating a language word is harmful, is both harmful and unnecessary, since we already have a lingua franca, which by the way means a language in which foreigners communicate. We already have English, and we don't see why we should jeopardize the, the, um, the widespread emergence of English by uh, introducing a competing Esperanto language. 
When we already have children speaking in English, even though they're, uh, they're unconnected to the West, we have people in Asia communicating with people from Eastern Europe, for example, in the English language, we don't see why we should also introduce Esperanto, and we don't see why ordinary people would actually be motivated to learn it. And in addition to this, about the minor point they made in relation to free movement of people, that it would be easier for people to move from, a, from one country to another, we think that that's already possible with English, and again, we're still going to have barriers to do with the fact that people speak different languages in different countries, and Esperanto will not change that. So for all the reasons that I have enumerated with strong opinion, I should be